session, very short problem session, when we work on uh, problems, on solutions of problems of homework 2. In homework 2, had problem number 7, and that was on page uh, 2103 of the textbook. Then it had questions uh, B and C, problem number 9. Actually, 9 was C, but uh, we can give also the solution of B here, just for practice. And problem 10 actually is very similar to that, so I invite you to work on that, work on that problem. And uh, then we had problem 14, B and C. Questions B and C. So let's work, let's begin with problem 7 uh, of the text. Problem 7 on page 103 of the textbook. So we have a plane. Let's say that this is a plane here. Uh, well, it doesn't look like a plane to me. Uh, well, so that's a plane. So this is a plane, and it goes through different stations, and each of the stations has to shoot the plane. Let's put the stations here. The way it visits the stations is from S1 to S2 to S3 to S4 and to S5. And each station can shoot down the plane. Of course, if the plane is shot down, let's say, at station S2, it will never reach the remaining stations, 3, 4, and 5. But to get to S2, it has to go through station S1. So they, actually the hint that the problem that the book is giving is totally incorrect because the event that the plane is shot down at station S1 is not independent from the event that the, play, that the, uh, that the plane is shot down at station S2. To reach S2, it has first to pass through S1, so the, the event, the outcome of, S, of what will happen in S1 actually influences what will happen in S2 and in any subsequent station. So, no independence of events here. Independence of um, successfully shooting down the plane. On at any of the stations S1 or S5. So we want to calculate the probability that the plane uh, passes uh, through uh, passes through all of its targets, uh, all of its stays, all of the defense stations, and. Uh, before it does not pass actually all the event stations it gets shot down before it reaches the target so it means that the probability that plane is shot down at one of these stations okay that, so this exactly is 1 minus the probability that the plane passes plane passes successfully from all stations and actually this is a probability that we can more easily calculate so if we denote that um, di, where i now goes from 1 through 5 because we have 5 stations, is the event when plane shot down at station i, then the probability I want to calculate is the probability that a 
of the complements of all of these events, D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. So we take the complements of these events. We want all of them to occur, uh, to, to co-occur, because otherwise the, pass, the plane will not pass successfully from all of these stations. So if we go from the last one, let's see, we take the probability that the plane does not get at D5, given it did not get shot down at these three stations, at these four stations, the four previous stations. And that would be times the probability that it didn't get shot Okay? Now, this is a probability that we need to calculate. But this probability here is a probability that we know already. If the plane arrives before at station 5, then station 5 has a probability of 0.1 of shooting the plane and 0.9 to not shoot the plane. So this probability is 0.9. It's exactly the probability of station 5 not shooting down the plane. Now, we have to calculate this probability. Let's keep that for the time being. Let's look again at this, because what we will do is to essentially peel off the proof, the actual structure, the actual calculations by repeating this several times. So this is likewise PD4 prime, given that the... So it's the probability of successfully passing through stations 1, 2, and 3 and not being shot at D4. So this is again 0.9. So now we have to calculate this probability. And you understand that I'll do exactly the same thing again. Now this time gets easier. And now let's look at this probability because this will, this is again 0.9. And let's look at this probability because this actually will be the one that we need to calculate and everything else will come together, will come in place. So this is the probability that the, the plane is not shot at place at station 2, given that it successfully passed station 1. Of course, this probability is 0.9, but also this probability here is 0.9. So this is 0.9 squared. Once this is 0.9 squared, now you can look, this is 0.9 cubed. And of course, this will be 0.9 to the fourth power. And this will become equal to 0.9 to the fifth power. So the, the probability that the plane does not make the target, which is what the problem for its target, because it's been shot previously, to, by passing through one of these stations is 1 minus 0 0.9 to the fifth power. And you can leave it like that. You don't have to do all this calculation. So that takes uh, care of problem number seven. Now, the statement in the book, as I explained, is incorrect, but the book wanted to avoid uh, essentially using all these solution, which is probably, uh, to the eyes of the author, more complicated than what it should be. Now, if you had to write a problem for, an, uh, for a quiz or for an exam or for your homework, all that I have written here is just more than enough 
You see, I explained my notation, and then I did my calculations. And of course, um, what I would do is not go directly then and put that here, but then just derive it from this point on. I would have continued here and said then P of T1, T2, T3 would be 0.9 cube, and therefore P D1 D3D4 D4 9 to the fourth power. This 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 is why this is how it should have been written at the end. Okay? And that would have been the answer. Then I would have gone here. All right, so let's, uh, let's see, let's put an end to this problem. We are done with this. Now let's move to problem number, uh, number nine. So we have a device which responds, device responds. We have a device that if it detects an error in one of its pipes, then it's uh, designed to signal and say, hey, I've got problems here. So we have defective, non-defective, but sometimes, you know, you may do it wrong. So here are the probabilities of these occurrences, but what I want to, to, to show here, which is very important, is that each of these positions, let's say this position, is the probability of getting a response oh uh, here is no there would be no response no signal and it signals here so that will be the probability that uh, device defective device is defective and not conditional and no signal is given. This is exactly how we should read this table. Okay? It's probabilities with intersections because it actually talking about two different conditions. And the positions that we have, each of the positions is interpreted as the co-occurrence of these two conditions. This is not true for all tables of this kind that you see. This is a typical type of table which is called contingency table. And that's, uh, contingency tables are defined in such a way that each position of the table gives us the intersection, the probability of the intersection of these, of one or two, of two events, uh, or, or of two, two conditions. One condition is tabulated by uh, vertically on the y on the uh, y direction, and the other condition is tabulated in the x direction. And if you want more direction, more conditions, then we have to go to multi-dimensional, uh, more than two-dimensional table, contingency table. Okay, so we understand this. Let's see now what is uh, B here. What is the probability that the device is not defective? Well, the device is not defective, not defective. The device is not defective and it can signal, but it may not signal. But there is no anything in between. So we add the probabilities that the device is non-defective and it signals, and the probability that the device is non-defective and signals, and does not signals. 
This is the first element of the second row, so this is point zero 0.2, and this is the other element, so all this gives us point 0.94. Now let's go to question C. If the device signals a defect, what is the probability that the pipe is actually non-defective? I wouldn't, I would never give you the problem with conditional probability. I would say, if the device signals a defect, what is the probability that the device is actually non-defective? So here you have a conditional probability, and the conditional probability is device non-defective, given that it signals So the fact that this device signals a defect is something that now that needs to be considered. So if it signals a defect, we're in this situation here. So we apply the definition of conditional probability. So that would be we divide by the probability of a condition signals defect. And in the numerator, we have the probability of non-defective that the device is non-defective, and it signals defect. So that's the definition, the intersection of the two events, event and condition, divided by the probability of the condition. That's exactly the definition of conditional probability. So we know that if the device is non-defective, the, the probability that the device is non-defective and yet it signals, it's 0 0.02. And the, the probability that the device uh, is signals a defect is the sum of these two probabilities because the device may signal if it is defective and it may do it while it is defective and while it is not defective. So again, as we did before, we had the probability, so that is 0 0.07 here. So the probability is two sevens. Let me write it down also. So this is exactly what gives us the calculation we need for the denumerator here. Uh, the probability that it signals a defect, it's the sum of the probabilities we have in the column signal. Because it is this event, it, the device signals a defect and it is actually defective, and it is actually defective, or it signals a defect and it is not defective. There is no other condition in between, and these two events, as we have them here, this and this, are exclusive, therefore I add the probabilities, and this is why we add the probabilities on the columns and on the rows because in the contingency table the events that are depicted at each cell of the table are exclusive with respect to another uh, event uh, are exclusive from another event uh, of the table so I think we're done with this problem, and now let's move to the last problem from this which was problem 14 with the balls. So in problem 14, we have two balls, A1, which has uh, three red and two white chips, and ball number two, let's call them B1 and B2. The B2 has, uh, ah, well, the problem gives us names to them, so let's follow the names of the problem, A1 and A2. And the second ball contains uh, two red and five white chips. Now, to decide which ball you will pick to select to draw a chip from, you cast a die. And this is selected if you take a face value, you have a face value which is 5 or 6, and this is 
if roll if you roll and one two three four yeah up to four so here the probability of selecting a one is actually two six which is one third and the probability of selecting the ball a two is actually four sixths which makes it two thirds and by a1 and a2 I mean select high ball to draw the chip from and then we with w is draw a white chip so here is my notation so you see I've already put my notation Question B says, given that a white chip is observed, compute the conditional probability that it came from A1. So now we want the event that has occurred is that we observe a white chip. That we observe that W actually occurred. So this is a posterior probability because the event that we drew a white chip has already occurred. So then, so therefore, what we will use is Bayes' theorem. So we, in Bayes' theorem, first of all, we trade the roles of these two. So the posterior, uh, the, the event becomes uh, condition and the condition becomes event. Times the probability that we have A1. And we divide by the probability of W. And the probability of W drawing a white ball, a white ball can be drawn either from one, from ball one, or from ball two. So now we use to express uh, the probability of W, the, role, the rule of total probability, and that would give you here two terms, a sum of two terms. The first term is exactly the same as the numerator, and that is always the case. The second is that expresses the probability that the white ball that you drew a white ball and you drew it from uh, ball number two so this is exactly law of total probability and it's nothing else but p of w so this is base rule now we'll look at all of let's see if we have all the numbers we need uh, to draw a white ball from a1 that's the probability that probability is two-fifths, and the probability that you draw from the first ball, as we argued already, is one-third. To draw a white ball from the second ball is uh, five-sevenths. And you draw from the second ball with probability of two-thirds. So that will actually give us this and you do the math and you get what you get question c now is asking something different we compare the probability p of a1 given w which is to draw a white ball and the probability the prior as we call it the prior probability a1 Okay, now the prior probability is one third. But this probability is actually smaller if you make the calculation. This probability, if you do the calculation here, will be actually, uh, if you do the math here, will be 0.21875. Let's round it to 0.22. 0.22 is definitely less than 0.33, which is this probability here. So this is 0.22, and this is roughly 0.33. And the question is, why we have this? Is it, is it counterintuitive? And the actual 
um, the actual truth. It is yes, it is it, it is not counterintuitive because the first ball contains in percentage less white balls than the second ball. See, the first ball contains two-fifths, which is less than half of the balls in the first ball are white, whereas more than half of the balls, much more than half of the balls in A2 are white. So, given the observation that you have a white ball drawn, that ball is more likely to come from ball number two rather than to come from ball number one. There is also another reason that, uh, of course, uh, ball number two is more likely to be selected. Uh, but here, since you only want to compare this posterior probability with this prior probability, the only thing you, you, you have exactly to argue that the number of white balls in the first uh, is actually smaller than the number of white balls in the second, and therefore if you draw a white ball, it's more likely to come from the second ball than from the first ball, and therefore that pushes the, con the posterior probability to be lower than the prior probability. So it's not counterintuitive. It's something that is uh, that is expected. So we would write in short that first ball contains less white balls from the other ball. So a white ball is more likely to come from the second ball than from the first. So the posterior is expected to be smaller than the prior A1. Than this prior. The prior that uh, ball number one is selected. If the two balls had exactly the same number of balls, then this probability would not have gone down. We have remained precisely 0.33. It goes down exactly because of the reason that less than half of the balls in the, the composition of the white balls and red balls is not the same as the composition of white balls and red balls in the second ball. And with this, I guess we conclude this particular short session. Thanks a lot for attending, and I hope that you found it helpful. Good luck with your exam.